Allow me to welcome all of you uh, in this very cozy atmosphere in Hotel Avalon, uh, where we are going to discuss uh, very important issues. Uh, the philosophy behind this conference uh, is very simple. Uh, a few months ago, Latvia ended up its uh, presidency in the EU Council, and one of uh, Latvian priorities in the EU uh, Presidency Council was to keep high on the agenda cooperation with Central Asia. Uh, and during Latvian Presidency, as you may know, uh, European Commission, together with Member States, uh, redrafted, reconsidered, and rediscussed uh, already adopted in 2007 EU strategy uh, for Central Asia. So now uh, European External Action Service is in charge of putting forward concrete proposals how to proceed in the most efficient way. So therefore this conference is very timely uh, because uh, the results of our discussions, uh, different uh, recommendations and policy proposals will be comprised later on in the report which will be, uh, I don't know whether in full or summary, will be available and ideas will be definitely passed over to to European Commission and External Action Service for consideration uh, further on uh, when they will be working on uh, implementation of the strategy. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, all participants of the conference because we have guests coming from very far away because, again, philosophy of uh, uh, this conference was based uh, not on talking ourselves but more on listening what people from specialists, experts, politicians from the region are telling us and sharing their experiences. So thank you very much for coming so long way to Latvia. I also want to thank uh, organizers of this conference, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, who are very, very supportive in putting together this conference, and also a team of uh, Latvian Transatlantic Organization, uh, who also supported uh, the implementation of the concept uh, of uh, discussions on Central Asia. So, thank you very much for coming. Uh, I really encourage everybody to actively take part and to discuss, ask questions, and put forward ideas. And I'm sure I will make sure that these ideas will be heard after this conference. And now I will pass the floor to Andre Strass from Latvian Bank, uh, who is going to chair the first session on economic cooperation, because economy, as we know, is the foundation of everything. So please, Andre. <coughs> Okay, yeah, so is this on? Yes. Uh, so thank you, Janet. Uh, thank you for inviting me to chair this uh, panel. So my name is Andris, as you heard. So today is uh, the Names Day for Andris in, in Latvia. So you are my Names Day present. And Names Days are very important in Latvia, as you might know. Um, so uh, with that, um, I would like uh, to invite uh, here to the front uh, the, the, the panelists for the first uh, session. So please. And uh, as, 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 as you take the floor, uh, I will try to introduce you. Um, so, uh, uh, in the order, uh, they have now taken their seats. Uh, um, so, we start uh, on, the, on the far left uh, with, uh, with Ambassador Hairi Haret Yalau, uh, the ambassador uh, of Turkey uh, to, to, to Latvia. Um, so, Ambassador uh, has been serving uh, in uh, in foreign uh, affairs for a long time, so uh, actually I calculated that he started at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Turkey three years after I was born, so uh, so he has a wealth of experience to, to share, I'm sure. Um, so next to him uh, is uh, Nora Luka Anceski, uh, who is uh, from Glasgow, actually, so Viva la Escocia Libre. Uh, but uh, actually, um, he's a researcher on Central uh, Asian uh, matters and, and also has a lot of publications. 
then uh, we have uh, Dr. Yasher Sari, uh, who is currently working as professor in, uh, in two universities, a university in Bolu, Turkey, and, and another university in uh, Bishkek in, in Kyrgyzstan. So that's also what academics in Latvia actually frequently do. They, they teach at two universities just to survive. Uh, and, uh, and finally, uh, last but not least, uh, it's, uh, it's Mr. Saken Mukan. Uh, who is from uh, Kazakhstan, and, but he is actually now teaching uh, uh, in, uh, in the advanced program uh, in, in, in law and economics uh, at the Riga Graduate School of Law. So uh, he's just next door to, uh, to the Stockholm School of Economics in Riga, where uh, I also spend still part, a little bit of my time. Uh, so he's in a way a, a Competitor, I, I always wonder why they teach economics at this graduate school of law, but maybe, okay, maybe you can discuss that in the coffee break. Uh, but anyway, um, so uh, with that, uh, actually, uh, I have now introduced the, the speakers and myself. I would like to give uh, just uh, a little bit of background against which uh, this discussion is, is taking place. So, uh, Janet already mentioned. Uh, uh, that uh, Central Asia, so EU relations with Central Asia were one of the uh, priorities of the, the Latvian presidency in the EU Council. Uh, but uh, now if we just look at what happened yesterday or last night, what, what's happening today or going to happen today, so there are some, some broader events uh, going on. And in particular, you, uh, you, you, you saw last night, uh, so the heads of state and government of the EU meeting uh, with their counterpart, with their Turkish counterpart, uh, so quite a lengthy press statement. Also after that, probably the ambassador can, can, give, can give us a little bit more detail on, on, on that later, so I will not steal the, uh, the talk from him. Uh, but then uh, the, other, uh, the other event that is going to happen today uh, actually, uh, the board of uh, directors of the International Monetary Fund are, are going to meet. So now they are still sleeping uh, in, in, in Washington. Uh, it's, it's night, but uh, they will meet later today. And when they meet, uh, they will decide on uh, including uh, the Chinese yuan uh, in the special drawing rights basket, so in the reserve currency basket of the International Monetary Fund, so Chinese Yuan will become the kind of fifth, uh, uh, or actually will become, I, I guess, the third most important reserve currency uh, right, uh, uh, right away after, uh, after this anticipated decision. So China is, is definitely rising, is still rising, and and of course that has an impact also on this discussion and has an impact on the Central Asian uh, region. Um, but uh, with this uh, brief background, um, so this is the, the longest you heard from me, um, so I will not try to interfere too much, uh, just to set a direction uh, for what's going on in the panel. And actually um, uh, I would like uh, to start uh, with, uh, uh, with, with, with Mr. Mukan uh, and ask him about uh, uh, the situation in, uh, in, in Kazakhstan in particular and, and the potential for, uh, for, for cooperation with, uh, I guess you cannot ignore China there as well, and with the, with the EU of course in particular, and maybe in, in answering your, uh, or, or, or giving your initial remarks, you can also answer a question I have always wondered, uh, I mean, Russia and Kazakhstan, okay, they're not, they're not equal in, in terms of their economic structure, but they're still fairly similar, so they're both kind of resource-driven economies. Um, so what's the point of, of having a customs union be, between them? So, so wouldn't it make more sense to have a customs union with, with China, for example? So Kazakhstan and China would, would make more sense to me. Um, so please, the floor is yours. Thank you for giving the floor. Uh, yeah, from the perspective of Kazakhstan, uh, the cooperation between Central Asia and, and uh, EU actually is uh, also one of the priority of, uh, foreign po uh, priority of the foreign policy by Kazakhstan that is today is also taking place in the agenda of the Kazakhstan's foreign policy at all. But before coming to that point of view, before uh, talking about the uh, Central Asia and the EU cooperation perspectives, 
I would like to answer for the questions of the, uh, by Mr. Strass on the talk on the why do Kazakhstan uh, has so close cooperation with Russia in terms of the custom unions and the creating the so uh, Eurasian Economic Union, uh, not taking into account the Chinese potential to cooperate closely with China and so forth. Uh, we should. Uh, there is the one of the most important uh, uh, accent uh, point here is that the Kazakhstan is the world's largest uh, landlocked country. Uh, this is really uh, critical for Kazakhstan, and uh, and uh, since getting independence, the Republic of Kazakhstan uh, started to um, uh, to conduct so-called multilateral policy to invest, uh, to, to attract the, the foreign investment, not only from Russia and China, but also from the uh, Western countries. So this multi-vector policy says that has, uh, equal, uh, has uh, uh, taking into account the, the good neighboring relationships with the neighbors first, and then uh, the relationship with the other countries in terms of the uh, attracting investment. The, the, this is one of the main priority of the foreign policy that uh, that Kazakhstan pursued. Um, so, in this sense, the in 1994, actually, when 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 people say about the Eurasian Economic Union, uh, uh, the, the, the automatically, uh, especially in Western in Western academic society, actually, uh, Russian around the Eurasian Economic Union. But if, if we're talking about the historical preconditions of creating this union, we can understand, and I mean, we can see that in 1994, President Nazarbayev announced that in front of the faculty member of the Lomonosov University in Moscow the idea of the creation of Eurasian Union. Uh, the, the, the idea is that, of course, the Kazakhstan is pursuing its own national interest in terms of the uh, transferring its own um, uh, the. In terms of the exporting its own potential uh, via the uh, countries who are neighboring, at the same time um, having the so-called uh, having the uh, in, uh, involved in integration process for Kazakhstan, integration process activities is really is really important in terms of being into uh, taking into account that is the largest landlocked country and. Uh, uh, in these terms, that this this his, historical movement actually started so uh, not so quickly because in Central Asian countries, not all Central Asian countries already agreed on the on terms of the Eurasian economy, uh, Eurasian idea that taking account that it, it could be bring into the uh, past historical um, I mean taking into account that the historical perspective was the. Um, Russian influence or, or the recreating Soviet Union actually. So in this case that the uh, that the Eurasian Economic Union was the uh, this is the, the, the that project that would be able that the Kazakhstan to uh, have its own national interest in terms of the exporting its own uh, goods uh, via Russia for example the, the, the or for other kind of project uh, pipeline projects. So this was one of the main priority of the Kazakhstan foreign policy to create, uh, to be involved in the integration process due, due, due its own geopolitical locations. In terms of the, in terms of the why not China, uh, why China is not uh, that kind of country that we would not be able to, we would be able to cooperate closely rather than resource driving economies that, that Russia uh, has today, uh, the similar uh, economic policy that uh, Kazakhstan is doing actually, this is probably, I would say, from historical perspectives also, because uh, it's really sensitive for Central Asians, especially for Kazakhstan, to have the uh, uh, to have the that kind of barrier with the Kazakhstan, uh, with the Central Asian countries and the China in terms of that the, uh, the, the the China itself actually. In terms of population, could uh, that, that that restrict the Chinese population? Just in terms of the population, I mean that restrict the Chinese population come to Central Asia. The restrict actually barrier not to let the Chinese population come to Kazakhstan, and of course doing its own uh, like uh, uh, soft power issues in, in, in terms of the 
um, in terms of the population in China. So, but the second idea that uh, that's of course that I would like to point out is that as we know that the China is a huge huge country and the Western China is not well developed in comparison with Eastern China, and there is no mean there, there that was no mean to cooperate closely with China in terms of that Western China that is working with Central Asian countries. Uh, that there are uh, that for Chinese actually uh, the the for Chinese companies for Chinese administration it was the beneficial to have the uh, pipeline projects uh, from from the Central Asian countries only to to consume uh, to to, be, to consume the or to benefit uh, to to yes to consume the western part of China. So in these terms, uh, with China, basically we are in the that in that cooperation, basically via the Shanghai Cooperation Organizations. This is also just uh, has its own agenda on that time. But basically, uh, in terms of the, uh, uh, and the and the really just it's it's really interesting for me also to f find out that kind of issues that the um, Eurasian Economic Union actually is not uh, is not only that. Uh, Production projects that would be able to contribute its its beneficial idea only for Russians, but also for uh, for the huge market as for Kazakhstan. That at least we we, we see the the, the, the the benefits on now not only for just for temporary time, but also for the long term perspective. So that's the main issues that of course that that the idea that. Uh, Eurasian Economic Union, I would say that it was the project by the Kazakhstan we initiated and it works and uh, anyhow there are skeptics comes but also anyhow for long term strategy it is one of the, I don't know, it is, at least we hope that it will bring the benefits and so forth. Okay. Okay. So, so now I have to press you or uh, push you a bit more on, on the Kazakhstan EU uh, per perspective. So, uh, yeah. what, what's the role in, of, of the EU and the whole thing? So, okay, China, you're kind of a bit hesitant, uh, too much cooperation, in particular with the Western part uh, of, of, of China. Um, so, uh, uh, does this uh, Eurasian Union thing uh, restrict in any way cooperation between Kazakhstan and, and European Union? Uh, the most important issue is that in this case that the, uh, we're going to have the enhanced, enhanced agreement, uh, cooperation agreement with EU that will be signed in, uh, in December this year. And uh, take into because the last one was updated in 1999 uh, between Kazakhstan and the EU actually, and it works despite of the uh, despite of the, um, the, the, the 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 preconditions of creating the Eurasian Economic Union. But it, 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 being in the Eurasian Economic Union, uh, the following such so-called uh, multi-vector policy that 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 is conducting uh, the, by by Kazakhstan. So, Kazakhstan achieved this kind of the agreement with the um, uh, EU, uh, I think with Barroso, which President Nazarbayev signed a pre pre preliminary agreement in November 2014. And then in, in the 1st of the January 2015, the Eurasian Economic Union started to conduct its, uh, its own activity in, in, in terms of the identifying that the Eurasian Economic Union is also the <coughs> The, the, the initial project that would be run for the future perspective. Uh, so, uh, in this case, it's just, yeah, my answer is just following this multi vector policy, uh, the Kazakhstan is going to sign to enhance it, uh, the, the, the cooperation agreement with EU. And uh, I have just arrived from the Brussels that we also, in the uh, EU External Action Service, also is. is, is Broadly discussing about this agreement in terms of what can Kazakhstan uh, be able to uh, have, what Kazakhstan can give to EU, and what kind of the measures would be taken by EU in terms of the uh, being a, a part of Eurasian Economic Union by Kazakhstan. So this is our really just interesting projects in terms of the uh, mutual corporations and mutual benefits, not only just asking for something and giving the back. I mean, asking for something and giving back nothing. Just this is quite mutual understanding, mutual beneficial project that 
that, that, that for, for future generations, I hope that it will give its own fruits. Okay, thank, well, you. thank you. Thank you very much for these initial remarks and also for answering my question. Um, as next one, I would uh, like um, to give floor to uh, uh, Dr. Sari. And in particular, uh, my, my question would be, of course, Kazakhstan is the, is the largest uh, by population, by, by any means, country in the Central Asia, but uh, Central Asia is not only Kazakhstan, so there are also other countries. Okay. And in particular, in particular, there are countries uh, which are not as resource-rich, such as Kyrgyzstan and, and Tajikistan. Uh, so, in particular, I, I know you, that you have a wealth of experience in, in Kyrgyzstan, so maybe you can, uh, you can share uh, your... Uh, your view. First, I would like to uh, thank the Foreign Minister of the uh, Republic of Latvia and the uh, Latvian Transatlantic Organization and uh, Center for International Studies. Um, coming from uh, the other side of the former Soviet uh, Union to uh, the Baltic uh, state, it's giving me opportunity to see the, some differences uh, differences between these two regions. Um, Kyrgyzstan, yes, Kyrgyzstan is the one of the smallest country in Central Asia and of course uh, previously a uh, previous speaker talked about the Kazakhstan and uh, Kyrgyzstan because of the small state has a different uh, approach on the different issues. Uh, as you know uh, Kyrgyzstan 2000, at the beginning of 2015 enter the uh, Eurasian Economic Union. But uh, the president of the Kyrgyzstan, Almaz Bega Tambayev, uh, to convince the, his uh, people, and he say, yes, we are choosing the lesser evil, no offense to member state of the, this organization. So <laughs> Kyrgyzstan didn't have much opportunity, much uh, alternative to choose in that sense. Uh, to explain the Kyrgyzstan, uh, choice, uh, we need to first look at what a uh, small state can do, because Kyrgyzstan can consider as a small state. Um, a small state have been observed to be different from their larger neighbor, like uh, Kazakhstan in case of Kyr Kyrgyzstan, and they have different economic structure and their domestic uh, policy making framework also different. So. For that reason, the uh, Kyrgyzstan as a small state need to act differently in security policy, in international relation, in, and in uh, relation with the international organization or regional organization, such as European Union. Um, so there is a definition uh, on this uh, small state. I won't uh, go over that one because I prepare as an academic presentation, but I understand that this is more uh, discussion, more uh, this, uh, the, this presentations are more based on the discussion. So, uh, there's an area, Kyrgyzstan is a small country, I mean, to, uh, almost 200,000 kilometers square. And uh, recently uh, they celebrated, they reached the 6 million people. Um, and their GDP is nominal uh, 6.7 billion dollars, and per capita is the, just over 1,000 uh, dollars. Landlock, mountains, uh, the country. Uh, this is the and uh, the Kyrgyz economy depends on the agricultural products and trade. Uh, but the, comparing the other neighboring country, Kyrgyzstan has uh, their economic uh, transformation earlier than the other countries. Uh, the, the first country uh, has the, its own national currency, some, and the first country in the region became the member of. World Trade Organization in 1998, and the, uh, this is of course the uh, and also use shock therapy policy to uh, change the economic structure, but that causes uh, uh, a lot of problem in Kyrgyzstan. The uh, industrial sector is collapsed, and Kyrgyzstan become uh, depend on the um, re-exporting uh, the goods from China. Um, I didn't touch the, if you look at the Kyrgyzstan uh, neighboring countries, the east part is the China, the, the south is the Tajikistan, the west is the um, Uzbekistan, and north is Kazakhstan. So uh, Kyrgyzstan uh, became a country transporting Chinese goods to other countries. 
especially in the southern region in the near the Uzbek border, uh, Karasu Bazar, Bazar area, and the, in uh, in near the Bishkek, uh, the Alamadin Bazar. Uh, those products, uh, Chinese products, coming to Kyrgyzstan and distributing Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and Russia and other countries. This uh, trade became the one third of the whole GDP of the Kyrgyzstan. So this is the important part, and also inside the country, the biggest uh, the employer uh, employment opportunity for the Kyrgyz people. So the 85 percent of the uh, their products, Chinese products, coming to Kyrgyzstan, re-exported to Russia and the Kazakhstan. So if you look at Kyrgyzstan, there is economically no significant production except. Uh, natural resources uh, gold, not as uh, as big as the uh, the Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and uh, Turkmenistan has as a natural resources. But still, this gold uh, mining, which is the uh, the Canadian uh, company Centera is doing this one, is the 52 uh, percent of the whole Kyrgyz export uh, recovery. Um, uh, and Kurdistan is the, depends on the foreign aids, and especially European Union has uh, uh, supporting development project in the country. But the, one of the main resources of its um, uh, main resource of the Kurdistan is the remittances, uh, labor remittances coming uh, from Russia and the Kazakhstan. Especially in Russia, more than 670,000 Kurdish people are living. And this is remittance is the 35 percent of the whole Kyrgyzstan GDP. That is the huge number. This is remind me in 1970s, uh, 60s, 70s, Turkey had the, uh, remit depends on the remittance. Okay. So when we look the export import uh, partners, we can see. Uh, I mean the uh, the export countries is uh, written as Switzerland. The reason is the Switzerland is not that they have the high trade. But because of those gold uh, mined in Kyrgyzstan is going to Switzerland, this Canadian company taking to Switzerland. Uh, the Switzerland, Kazakhstan, Russia, uh, Uzbekistan, China, Turkey is the main uh, export partner. And the import is the mainly Russia, China, Kazakhstan, uh, we can see. So this is very clearly you can see that Kyrgyzstan economically uh, depends on the Russia because of the, uh, the strategic products like the oil, gas, mainly coming from Russia, and also 35% uh, of remittances coming uh, laborers who are working in uh, Russia. So, what is the advantages of joining the uh, Eurasian Economic Union for the Kyrgyzstan? First, trade with the Eurasian Customs Union countries, a custom re revenue will increase. Uh, this is the one uh, example. Kyrgyzstan has a border with China for, uh, and they are trading. According to Chinese uh, statistic, uh, the Chinese are selling the $9 billion uh, product. But according to China, uh, Kyrgyz pro, uh, statistic, is the over $1 billion. So $8 billion uh, Chinese product, when they are entering the country, is not I mean, paying the uh, taxes uh, in that sense. So border security will ensure investment and labor remittances will increase. Uh, what is the disadvantage of joining the Eurasian economy? First, losing its re-export uh, character. I mean, the, the bazaars becoming smaller, less people will employ, they will lose job, and they will start looking for new opportunities. So on, on, on that way, unemployment of people working in those bazaars will increase. Uh, and second is the rise of the consumer uh, products, uh, goods, because of higher uh, custom tax uh, will, uh, uh, will uh, increase the product. And when we compare the advantages and disadvantages, we can say that economic disadvantages outweigh the, uh, the economic advantages. So economically, the joining Kyrgyzstan to econo uh, the um, uh, Eurasian Economic uh, Custom Union is the Problem. So then the puzzle, why then Kyrgyzstan joining? So the puzzle is the, uh, uh, then we need to look at the non-economic uh, variables, which is the uh, why push the Kyrgyzstan side to joining economy, uh, uh, this union. Uh, first is the, 
the dependency on the Russia, economic weaknesses, access to a larger market, cultural hegemon of uh, Russian in, uh, in the region, in, especially in Kyrgyzstan, and bandwagoning ban effect and security cons and concern, especially related with uh, Uzbekistan and uh, at a certain level with the China. So, uh, as a small state, when they are joining the economic uh, uh, economic union, they look to several um, factors. Economic one, uh, small state have small uh, domestic market. External trade constitute higher portion of the GDP. Uh, therefore, small states seek the preferential trade agreement and economic integration. And this is the, and another uh, way to explain, if a small state already depend on a powerful state, or in Kyrgyz case is the Russia, it's easier to make integration decisions because uh, Kyrgyzstan can uh, get some subsidized uh, products from the, uh, uh, Russia, for example. They are paying less oil and the gas in that sense, comparatively. In security part, a small state security decision, uh, either uh, small state need to be neutral, like Turkmenistan did officially, or finding powerful friend like Ben Wagening, uh, joining the uh, locomotive uh, uh, to uh, to secure itself. Um, and, and we see that uh, Kyrgyzstan, because of the Central Asian uh, area, is a very uh, uh, vulnerable close to Afghanistan and security issues are becoming the important issues, then the, uh, because of the Kyrgyzstan cannot provide security its own border, then looking for the uh, possible alternative. That's the one reason why it uh, has closed. The other one is the cultural or more uh, legacy of past, we can say. I understand that uh, uh, Latvia is the past of legacy and not depend on the, what is in the past and become the more uh, the integrated the European Union, but the Kyrgyzstan and other uh, Central Asian countries is difficult to pass that uh, legacy. So uh, we see the uh, kind of ideological hegemony, powerful state uh, pushing the countries to uh, I mean the the elites in the small countries, educated by the Soviet time and that they consider is the Russia. Is the way to modernize the country, the way to open the world. Uh, so this is the nostalgia of the Soviet Union and the seeing uh, Russia as a modern example uh, for uh, for their own state. Leadership, of course, leaders also as an actor play important role because leaders uh, leadership is trying to consolidate their power. It will be easy to make to get. Uh, external support to staying in power. Uh, comparing the other Central Asian countries, Kyrgyzstan is the more democratic. The regime is the two times overthrown by the people. So uh, the leaders who want to stay in power need to have uh, support. If they cannot get the support internally, then they, need, uh, they are looking for the outside sources, which in international relation we call on the balancing. So, the, then, these cases, we can develop a working hypothesis, and I will finish this here. Um, um, for small state, other factors such as security concern, uh, cultural hegemony, leadership play strong role in joining uh, economic uh, union, despite economic is not viable. Because of the Kyrgyzstan depends on uh, Russia, security concern, fear of China and the Uzbekistan, Continuation of the Russian cultural hegemony on the elites, uh, Kyrgyzstan decided to join Eurasian Custom Union. One last thing is the, my colleague is told about 1994, um, the uh, Nazarbayev in the Moscow uh, to put the first the idea of the Eurasian Economic Union. We need to look to uh, international regional uh, conjecture in that time too. In 1994, is the Russian nationalism is. Uh, uh, rising and the uh, in the uh, Russian Duma uh, nationalists start to talk me about the, the creating the of, uh, the Soviet Union again and that is the uh, the Nazarbayev is uh, uh, to see this is uh, uh, problematic then he put the idea of the creating losing lose 
uh, union. But the Nazarbayev idea is the economic one, not the political one. He's emphasizing. But the, today we see the Putin's uh, Eurasian uh, economic union, they see it as a one step to, uh, to reaching the political union. In that sense, uh, the Nazarbayev's uh, uh, understanding of Eurasia and union is different than the Putin's understanding of Eurasia and Union. And similar to Eurasia as a concept, yes, it can be a geographical concept, but also a political, ideological concept. It's not just Russia. In Turkey also, people uh, is thinking and uh, talking about the Eurasia and the bringing the, together the, the Eurasian countries together. Thank you so much. Um, so one quick follow-up question, though, uh, from from me actually. So we saw, in case of Kazakhstan, this kind of more multilateral approach. So, in case of Kyrgyzstan, I understand it's more a bilateral uh, thing with with Russia. Okay, I'm exaggerating that a bit, but uh, but given that, uh, so w where do you see the the future for Kyrgyzstan and EU relations? Okay, first thing is the old Central Asian countries. Fifteen days ago, I was in Turkmenistan. And all Central Asian countries are saying that their foreign policy is based on multilateral, multidimensional uh, foreign policy. But in reality, and the, uh, the uh, rhetoric is different. So, in that sense, uh, Kyrgyzstan, if you look at the Kyrgyzstan concepts of foreign policy of Kyrgyzstan, it's saying multilateral, multidimensional, multilayer foreign policy. But, uh, if we co yes, Kyrgyzstan has very good relations with European countries, Turkey and other countries, but if we look at strategic issues, uh, strategic economic issues, political issues, Kyrgyzstan more tend to, uh, to close to Russia than the other countries. For that reason, we cannot say the uh, reality uh, Kyrgyzstan has the uh, uh, multilateral foreign policy. Well, yes, we can say multilateral diplomacy. That is different than the, having the uh, foreign policy. Uh, European Union relation with the Kyrgyzstan is the European Union uh, as an organization and European countries as a, uh, as a interest uh, on the Central Asia has very close relation with Kyrgyzstan. But that, is, that relation is limited. Uh, mainly European Union was funding the development projects and democratization process of the Kyrgyzstan. Uh, in that sense, different than the other Central Asian countries, relation between European Union and Kyrgyzstan, because Kyrgyzstan is more open, more uh, democratic, so then the, uh, the uh, European Union's funding, supporting uh, democratic institutions, civil society, uh, and also some uh, uh, the economic, uh, uh, and also the issues uh, with is uh, problematic for the Kyrgyzstan, like border issues with the neighboring countries, uh, the water issues, which is the, one of the uh, most important issues in the future uh, in Central Asia. Uh, so um, in 2007, when the German, uh, Germany became the, the president of the European Union, so published the first strategic uh, policy of the, of the, uh, for the Central Asia, for European countries. And good to Latvia is to continue that tradition and the putting the emphasis on the uh, Central Asian region. Okay. Thank you very much. Very, very interesting. So I'm sorry I will now pass Luca and uh, give uh, give floor uh, to the ambassador because I, I think the logical sequence is um, you have Central Asian countries and then you have Turkey and, and then you have the, the European Union. So Turkey is an important link in particular if you speak about energy potential. In energy cooperation uh, between Central Asia and, and, and the EU, and uh, of course, I wonder also whether you would uh, would like to comment on on la briefly on, on last night's uh, summit uh, in, in uh, between the EU and, and Turkey. I think one of the first things that we have to emphasize when we look at Central Asia is all the countries in Central Asia are very much dependent on couple of issues. One of them is security. The second one is stability. Because without these two, it is impossible for them to economically develop themselves. So there is enormous, in, uh, uh, shall we say, emphasis on security and, and uh, um, stability. So 
when we that is one of the reasons why there is I mean as you can uh, understand from the uh, the presentations there is enormous emphasis in all, in these countries on security who is going to supply security for this area is an important issue and I think after the Americans have abdicated uh, Central Asia from Central Asia, this has been taken over by Russia. So, in the security sphere, it is Russia. The second thing has to do with stability. What do we mean by stability? That means how do you keep this, the present status of government in place in terms of not very democratic structures. And this has to do also with strong leadership. But I think except Kyrgyzstan, we have to accept the fact that there is enormous um, emphasis in these countries on stability. And stability, with stability comes certain norms, which are not, shall we say, in line with what the European Union would expect. So. In those two th uh, important issues, Russia has been very helpful in the sense that they have always supported strong leadership in these countries and they have always supported um, uh, uh, security. One of the difficulties all of these countries have has to do with threats emanating from Afghanistan. Why Afghanistan? We, we haven't spoken about Afghanistan. It is the Islamization of the society. And as you know, in all of these countries, the most organized, shall we say, opposition is always religious. So there is also this is seen as a common threat by all these countries in the region. And that is the reason why one of the most important issues in Shanghai uh, Treaty has to do with how do we uh, look at Islam in this area. So uh, these are the things that I wanted to add. Regarding Turkey, first of all, since uh, the dissolution of the Soviet Empire, we have looked at the situation from a little bit different perspective. Because when we first entered Central Asia, we saw that the economic situation was terrible. Let me give you a couple of examples. In Kazakhstan, they were not able to produce bread. And one of the first exports and main exports to Kazakhstan was factories which would uh, uh, produce in large quantities bread. And how do you make flour? How do you, you know, make uh, the uh, necessary uh, flour, mix the flour with water and this and that for bread. About Tajikistan, they didn't know how to repair cars and car parts, which car parts to use. So we were very much involved in these small things in Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, uh, and this was done by an organization that we have called TIKA. TIKA has supplied the necessary um, uh, staff for small enterprises, you know, small uh, shops and things of this sort, and I think it is running to something close to three, three and a half billion dollars worth of um, training and also help for these small shops and industrial, shall we say, small and medium-sized uh, 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 enterprises. The second thing which we have done, you know, because people are always looking at the, at the uh, um, energy uh, issues, but we spent much more time and much more effort in training the uh, technicians which were, who were necessary. Because once the Russians left, there were no technicians and there were no um, uh, engineers to take uh, care of the uh, infrastructure. We have also helped countries like Uzbekistan where uh, they had 
a lot of difficulty in terms of environment, that environmental uh, difficulties. In how do you do environmental friendly agriculture in those countries? That's how we. But more than that, how do you collect taxes? How do you run a country? And that is one of the areas that we help these uh, countries by bringing in not only military uh, officers and this, but also government in terms of uh, fi financial uh, bureaucracy, uh, bureaucracy in terms of how do you run a country, how, uh, police, uh, policing, and uh, you know how do you administer? All of these are the areas where we helped. In, by training. The second thing we did was with the Exim Bank, we tried to help the people to form small enterprises. And these small enterprises have been very active in all of these countries. Because when you look at the large enterprises, a lot of them have to do with energy, uh, gas or oil. Because what Russia has done is uh, before it has left Central Asia, it has uh, signed a lot of contracts whereby they get oil, gas from Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, and they get it for a very cheap price, and they sell their products, the same products, to Europe or to other countries with almost a 30% uh, profit, sometimes much more than that. So. When you look at the large uh, investments, when you look at the large uh, industrial uh, or uh, energy issues, it is always Russia. Um, uh, they, Luke Oil, Rosneft uh, have been very, very uh, active. But when you look at the medium size, small size uh, industries, Turkey has been very active in those senses. But who else has been very active uh, lately? We also have to look at Korea who has been very active in, uh, in uh, uh, Uzbekistan. And we have to look at China, because I think the elephant in the room is China. China has been developing its infrastructure very uh, smartly, and they are tying the Southeast Asia through China with Central Asia and with Europe. And when you look at the infrastructure projects which have been initiated by China, over Kazakhstan uh, to the Caspian Sea, or over Kazakhstan and Russia to Europe. All of these uh, see the marks of China. So China is going to be a very important player also in the future. For the time being, they have refrained from issues which relate to security. They are much more, uh, shall we say, concentrated in uh, economic issues and in getting natural resources from these uh, countries. In terms of large projects, Turkey has been very much interested in transportation. Transportation from China to Europe. Transportation from China to Africa. So uh, we have been working on a railway line from Urumqi through Kazakhstan coming to Aktau, and from the Aktau with the ferry to uh, Baku, and from Baku with the railway line, which is uninterrupted, uh, there is only, I think we have two or three months to com complete the tunnels between us and Georgia, <coughs> you will have access, railroad access, all the way to London, or all the way to Madrid. So this is what we call the middle, uh, or uh, the medium line. Uh, another uh, country which has uh, been trying to get into uh, uh, Central Asia has been India. India, there is one difficulty uh, with India, it has been transportation in the sense that they don't have direct connection. They have been trying to prove, uh, to improve a situation, improve this situation, going through Iran, which is Bandar Abbas. From uh, all the Indian products will go through Iran, then go to Turkmenistan from that area. But at the end, you know, when we look at uh, you know, Central Asia in terms of energy matters, the, I can also talk about what we are trying to do with getting Turkmenistan 
to be part of TANAP. Uh, and also, if uh, there are other possibilities, because we already have uh, signed a, co a contract with Azerbaijan, and the gas fields between Azerbaijan and Turkmenistan are very close to, it can be connected. And it, there is a possibility for Turkmen gas to be delivered to uh, Europe. And I think uh, we'll uh, talk about this too. But the thing uh, which has uh, uh, changed in the whole um, I issue in this sense has to do with what is happen happening in the Caspian Sea. We have to see the firing of cruise missiles by Russians in the Caspian Sea as a threat to peace and cooperation in the Caspian Sea. Because this is not something normal. You do not fire uh, missiles from a sea which is supposed to be a sea of stability, cooperation and peace to other uh, countries uh, in the region. So we have to, I think one of the things that we have, the European Union can help solve is the situation on the Caspian. How do you do the delimitation of borders on the Caspian? And this is going to be a very important issue. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, so, Luca, you know, you, you know the difficult task. You're the, the last <laughs> speaker on, uh, on last but not least, of course, the last speaker on, on, on the panel for the introductory remarks. So I guess there will be uh, much, much more than that uh, afterwards. We still have quite a lot of time. But I think one issue that is not, uh, not yet covered or what has not been addressed um, is this kind of uh, diversification. Uh, in, in particular in the resource-rich uh, Central Asian countries away from a resource-driven economy in particular. I, I know that Kazakhstan has, uh, has at least uh, had some thoughts on, uh, on, on that, so uh, if, uh, if you would uh, maybe address uh, that, that situation in particular in the light of uh, the oil price now, uh, now being where it is and the gas price as, as well, so uh, if that situation persists, so what's, uh, what's the future for this Central Asian, in particular the resource-rich Central Asian countries? It's not a good future. Um, I'm afraid I let to be uh, pessimistic. If you look at the structures of the economies of the big energy production states, which are Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan, and if you look at the structure in 92, it's pretty much the same when you go 1915. There hasn't been an effort at diversification. There hasn't been just a talk, really, mostly in Kazakhstan about diversifying. But in practical terms, nothing has changed. The economy was very much dependent on energy in 92, and it's very much dependent in energy, which is all in Kazakhstan and Gas in 2015. Now, if the prices stayed up, that would have been a positive outlook for the elite short term. But the prices didn't stay up, in fact, they went down, and that created a series of problems and instigated two crises. I'm going to quick, quickly elaborate on the two. I have been arguing for a while that Central Asia's big producer states, energy producer states, are going to, to separate but somehow closely related crises. Turkmenistan got an export crisis and Kazakhstan got a production crisis. Turkmenistan got an got a export crisis because uh, Gazprom withdrew from Central Asia. They announced they will withdraw, and in 2025 they will be out of the market in the region completely. Uh, if you look at statistics up to four, four or five years ago, they were buying anything in between 32 and 38 uh, BCM per year from Turkmenistan. Last year they bought four. Um, the, the, sh the two short pipelines which connect Turkmenistan with Iran are uh, short, but there, there is some capability there. But Iran has been uh, edging their bets with the post sanctions scenario, and they have been uh, sending mixed messages whether or not these pipelines will keep working. In fact, my bet is that they will shut down, which leaves Turkmenistan with an exclusive relationship with China, 
we got to the point at which the 2009 pipeline, which was supposed to be the symbol of root diversification, the symbol of multi vectorism the success of an energy policy which Niazov first and Bertie Wamedov then employed, in fact, has become an uh, um, obstacle to the, to the development of a serious export policy for Turkmenistan. Turkmenistan is now in the very awkward position of being 100% dependent on China in 10, 15 years. And if that was uh, sort of manageable with high oil prices and in turn high gas prices, it's very unmanageable now. Also because, so on the one hand, they are selling the same produce at a much lower price. But even when it comes to the income, to the cash revenues in Turkmenistan, they're not getting anything because the way in which the deals were structured, that's, that's a much understood, China paid for the pipeline and they paid for the exploration uh, investment in Gakinish, which means that Turkmenistan is not getting any money for those deals. Uh, and now they have an awkward position in which they export 40 BCM, although they don't have a good tradition, good form, you say, in uh, fulfilling the quota every year, but they, in fact they haven't, only to China, which not only is operating in a system of lower oil prices, but could renegotiate at any time. And that's their first crisis, which makes other TANAP or TAPI the most important option for their intensification. Now, on the other, other crisis, Kazakhstan, uh, Kashagan has been a big blow. Uh, for the uh, for the Nazarbayev regime, they have been they have put so I mean, virtually all of their oil eggs in that basket, and when they realize that the extraction is a very expensive endeavor, as well as uh, they need to repiping because of the high sulfur and things like that, um, at a time in which oil prices went down over six months, that created a big blow for the budget. Um, when the crisis began, Kazakhstan was budgeting at 110, of course there was surprises back then, they thought that anything over 6 years was profitable, they now had to budget around 50 and they realized that since they're selling less oil, they're losing money rather than making money. Now, uh, this has, it has a big impact on the regime worldview. If you look at the rhetoric in Kazakhstan, which is very authoritarian state, but still somehow with uh, a few uh, elements of the Western political discourse, the regime has always been very um, interested in selling an image to the people of Kazakhstan. In fact, Nazarbayev sold this dream of middle class uh, fulfillment. And if you go to Kazakhstan, you realize that the infrastructure is getting better, that there is some wealth going on, at least in the urban centers. But in the last couple of years, with low oil, low oil prices, this dream is quickly vanishing, which instigates in turn a whole series of problems when it comes to issues of loyalty, legitimacy, and continuity in terms of where will come after Nazarbayev, because you know it's, it's an aging leader anyway. So this is the the twin, the twin crisis that I see in Central Asia. What is funny, and I find very paradoxical, thinking about what you asked the, the, the colleagues before about EU and EU, that when it comes to the uh, Eurasian Economic Union, of course that's true for Kazakhstan, not for Turkmenistan, who's not a member, when it comes to the Eurasian Economic Union, which has got its own institution, its own norms, if you want, its own framework, energy is not dealt with. It's out of the agenda. On the other hand, when it comes to the European Union, where you have a somehow shaky framework because you know we know that Kazakhstan is going for the for the PCA 2.0, but Turkmenistan is still regulated by a Soviet time um, agreement. There is no PCA sign there. Energy is the cornerstone of the agenda. There's a very big disbalance, disbalance between what they say they want to do and what they are actually doing, which is a common trend in Central Asia foreign policy making. However, when it comes to relation to third parties, big multilateral parties or uh, organizations that have a wider goal in the region, uh, placing or misplacing, as in the case of the EU, energy, which is 86% to Kmanisano, the revenues in Kazakhstan is very high as well, creates a 
complex and flawed, if you want, engagement agenda with the two, especially at a time in which either state is serious about diversification. Now, this morning, Nazarbayev has had this uh, annual uh, statement, statement, and I, I just got, caught a few glimpses. And at one point, he said, this year, uh, we only grow by 1.5%. Uh, which, of course, you know, in my own country, Italy would be great, but he, that's not the case. He said, we need to get 5%. That the kind of dream, which I was talking about before. 5% with oil at 48, 49, it's, it's, it, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen at all. So the point is that that kind of dream is very much eroded and it's, it, it's no longer about bandwagoning or uh, who being friends with or who making deals with. It's about um, realizing that not only these resources are finite, that one day they will not, but also that these regimes might be finite in the ways that they, they need to work out a uh, continuity agenda which goes beyond repression and fear. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I wonder now uh, whether uh, Dr. Mukam or Dr. Sri, whether you would like to react to any of, uh, of, of the remarks. The, the thing uh, he mentioned about the diversification and the price of the oil and gas is, of course, is a problem. And because these countries are, as he mentioned about the number, 85% and more, it's kind of, uh, they have Dutch disease. Is the uh, the problem uh, which they have. Um, the the other uh, point which we need to mention, maybe uh, related to Central Asia, the aging the leaders like Nazarbayev and the Kermo, and these leaders are the leading their countries more than 25 years, almost 30 years, uh, some, and in this uh, we don't know the. Uh, the what will happen after these leaders passed away. Um, that's other, maybe we need to mention uh, things the, in, in, important. Um, yes, the, the countries are still uh, the process of state building and nation building process are not finished yet. And that is also causing uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, problem. Um, the, the mention he mentioned about the uh, Turkmenistan has export crisis. Turkmenistan had ex export crisis before 2008 when the Russian decreased the, the level of the natural gas buying from Turkmenistan less than... But the price was high. The uh, price was high, yes, that's true. Then Turkmenistan looked for an alternative and defined the alternative from China. And this, until this time, three pipelines is uh, wielded. And the fourth one is the continued. I agree with him, Turkmenistan is also, as 15 days ago I was in Turkmenistan, they are also aware of that. They need to diversify their pipeline, but you are right, then the price is low. So this is the, uh, what they have. And the prediction about the, the feature of the natural gas um, market is comparing the, uh, the oil market is more uh, better I mean, prediction there are. Of course, the te technological development, uh, <coughs> this, uh, the Americans developed a new technology and the decreasing their dependence on the oil and gas from other countries, also uh, keeping the price low. And as we know, the price of natural gas and oil also related with the Russian, uh, Russian relation with the Western countries this time. So we don't know yet what will happen in that area. Uh, Dr. Mukhan, any remarks? Yeah, I just... Um, I, I, about energy issues was said, actually. I, I, I agree with that. Um, I would like to point out the game to, to, to go back to the Eurasian Economic Union project uh, in terms of the uh, understanding uh, the clearly the, 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 the projects in terms of the uh, value of this project at, at, at all. Of course, as my colleague mentions about the, the, the 
Eurasian, uh, uh, the, the, the concept of Eurasianism is, uh, of course, it is uh, different for, for, for Putin and different for Nazarbayev. And uh, um, in this cases, uh, the, the purely economic component of this union is really important from the Kazakhs' perspective. Um, not turn back to the, this kind of the ideological aspects that Eurasianism has is it in it a sense like Gumilev, Trubetsky, or um, yes, the, 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 that run it by this, by, by them. Uh, in, in terms of the, in, when we're talking about the Eurasian Economic Union, of course, directly it comes through Kazakhstan Russian relationships in all levels. It could be economic levels or political levels. So, in, in this sense, as I would like to point out that the, uh, in this case, the, 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 the announcement and the message by, 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 by another by them, even today also is that, I mean, it's taking place in Astana now, actually, and uh, the, the, the clear message that the, uh, whatever, I mean, whatever is happening in, uh, in neighboring countries or in the international arena, Kazakhstan has its own uh, multi-vectorial policy, uh, even though it was really uh, for expert communities in Kazakhstan and abroad also, it really was just a surprise for uh, Kazakh leadership that Kazakhstan at, uh, the, um, became a neutral position, I mean, the, the, the has a neutral position in UN General Assembly voting in Crimean annexation by Russia. Whereas other allies uh, in the original economic union, like Armenia and Belarus, also voted for benefit of the Russian position, which is also uh, the, the, the creates, despite of the close relations and, and cross border relations with Kazakhstan and Russia, and the, 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 the Nazarbayev says that in some cases, says, no, we, we, have, we, we would be able to, we would have to stay neutral. Uh, the same case was also with the Georgian Russia war in 2008. Also the same story. So in this in this sense, just I would like to point out that the um, that kind of perceptions that of course, a Russian Union is somehow it's like a, is, is a restoration of Soviet Union or restorations of the values that uh, that took place in Soviet Union. I just absolutely disagree with this. I mean, basically, uh, this is the some kind of purely economic uh, project that, of course, was mentioned by my colleagues. So, about energy issues, actually, I I, I really uh, agree with with the, with those that was said before. Uh, uh, oil prices uh, really, I mean, the the decrease in the oil prices is quite just. Up, yeah, affected Kazakhstan's economy. We have very big inflation now since 20th of August. About the 50% of, 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 of national currency devaluated. De and uh, that is the so anti crisis measures is taking place. Actually, it is of the. Uh, the, the, the um, that, that today's um, the message to the nations by President actually. We will see that what will happen, and and, and in, in next uh, in next few, in next years actually. So at least uh, there are some uh, there are some uh, the anti-crisis measure is taking place despite of the uh, me meaning that the uh, Expo 2017 is going to be in Astana actually, and some uh, maybe some of the projects will within the constructions of the Expo and the providing the Expo will be cut down actually because of the crisis so that's my thank you thank, thank you very much so uh, i guess we have been talking here uh, enough uh, in, in front uh, and i i would like actually uh, to throw it open uh, to the to the audience and uh, invite you to ask questions and when you ask a question please uh, state also briefly who you are Since nobody else, then Jeanette with the first question. Okay, the next is to you. I am. You get the mic uh, so that you don't get the mic. Okay, thank you, Jeanette Ozolin. Uh, I wanted to ask a question to Saken. It's more hypothetical, so we are both from academia, so we can allow ourselves to speculate a little bit. So putting together uh, different uh, views uh, expressed before, so China definitely is on the map in Central Asia. 
And uh, on the one hand, we have uh, Russia's vision of, uh, European, uh, of Eurasian Economic Union, which is very much geopolitical. Then there is a Kazakh view, which is more uh, economic. And then China is marching west, or uh, one belt, one road, whatever you call it, or Silk Road. So uh, China comes more with economic interests. Of course, security and stability is somewhere there, but still economy is uh, one of the priorities. You don't see the possibility of clash of interests between China's interest in Central Asia and also Russia's interest in Central Asia. So if China's presence is increasing, what could be reaction? Not so much from Russia's side, because we've seen it already with Eastern Partnership, but uh, what would happen with Central Asian countries? What would be their reactions? So Ken, could you please a little bit no speculate on that? Thank you very much, uh, Professor Zolnia. Actually, uh, the, 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 the project of Eurasian Economic Union itself is that decreasing the Chinese presence in, in Central Asia, if we say in short, I mean in short words, uh, Eurasian Economic Union itself actually uh, the, 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 the maintains the collaborations uh, within its memberships as EU has it, it is the same project actually, but in terms of the, uh, the, the, the China presence in Central Asia, I would say that the uh, mostly, I, I mean personally, I pay attention on the pipeline projects, uh, basically, uh, which is quite uh, popular, actually, uh, actions uh, in terms of the China, uh, Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan, especially, uh, to, to, to uh, diversify its pipeline projects, not only uh, Russian directions or other mi Middle Eastern directions, etc. So uh, my answer is just the uh, Eurasian Economic Union, and, and, and actually as a, as a Kazakhstanian, actually I feel and I see that the, after uh, the, the joining the Eurasian Economic Union, uh, I feel as a citizen of Kazakhstan that the Chinese uh, products the prices for Chinese goods in, in Kazakhstan, in Almaty, uh, uh, the price increased, or they somehow limited in terms of the quantity of the Chinese goods. And if we see, uh, as a citizens I, I, of this country, I, I see that the, uh, the Russian pro products uh, became more and more, and, uh, uh, and, and, and of course, the cheap, really. Um, so, in this sense, that my answer would be that the, 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 the Eurasian Economic Union, from Kazakh uh, view, this is the basically that restrict the Chinese uh, cheap uh, Chinese products uh, to Kazakh to, to, to Central Asia. And my colleague has also uh, elaborated on terms of the uh, uh, decreasing the level of the re-export things like uh, Kyrgyz, uh, uh, Kyrgyz, uh, and those goods that comes uh, from China to Kyrgyzstan and they would be re-exported actually uh, to other Central Asian countries, especially the, into Kazakhstan. Actually, the same happened with Belarus when the sanctions against Russia took place, that, that also Belarus played such kind of roles uh, with the re-exporting the goods. But uh, the tendency we have, the tendency, it happens when they, there is re-exporting, but the, the, anyhow, we see the limits of Chinese products that is coming to uh, to, to Central Asia, but in fact, the, but this, if you if you if you interview the citizens of uh, in term, I mean, if I tell, t t speak uh, from the Kazakh perspective, uh, Kazakhstan uh, people would uh, would choose the uh, maybe Russian products, uh, but less Chinese products as soon as the, uh, the 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 majority of the as I said before, uh, basically. Uh, basically, the the, the the Western China actually the main producers that are coming to uh, export coming to Central Asian countries they are from the West uh, Western China, where it's not well developed in comparison with the Eastern China. So that's my point. Is thank you. Yeah, I see uh, other panelists also want to react uh, to Janet's question. So, Ambassador, why don't we start with you? I think uh, one of the things that we have to uh, emphasize is demographics. And when you look at both Russia and Kazakhstan, they have a downward trend. And who's going to supply the demographics or the population? I mean, you have vast land with all the natural resources and the sinking population. 
and it is, you know... Would Turkey supply? Uh, we are supplying Europe. I think it will be the Chinese who will be supplying the demographics. I, I, we have to, you know, look at that uh, number one. And the second thing is China works very effectively and very wisely. It is, it happens slowly. But when you look at the technologies involved, the technology which is uh, uh, brought in by China, by Japan, by Korea, are much more superior than what is available from Russia. And when you look at the trade figures, yes, Russia has made great inroads into Kazakhstan because of this agreement. And it, it has worked very much against the interests of Kazakhstan. But the thing is, in the long run, Russia cannot produce the same wares with the same price. Even with the uh, tariffs which are introduced against China, it will still be very, very... Uh, uh, the rivalry will be very uh, intense. Uh, yeah, look, you also want to add something. I know that the question was posed as a hypothesis. But I would, uh, and I know, and this is probably one of the biggest things in my job at the moment, I would avoid to argue in terms of either or. There is space for both Russia and China. There is space for the European Union, there is space for India, there is space for everyone. But not because it's such a big market or because the tunes that is played in terms of influences relations is dictated by the Central Asian presidents rather than from by the foreign powers. It's been that for 25 years. They have been liaising with the US, with the Russian Federation, with China, at other times with Iran, with Turkey very strongly in the early 90s. Always and exclusively with the power preservation of the best interests. Uh, so uh, I know that it's sort of um, it's an interesting way of seeing things, you know, sort of zero sum game. Or, but uh, we risk not to understand what's going on in Central Asia if we keep looking at the region in those terms, uh, especially when we have such a gener such a very uh, sort of politically acute generations of leaders that have been able to anchor down the. Um, support to both domestic factors and external pageants. And we only had to ask my Kyrgyz colleague here about Bakiev to understand what actually happens when external support goes on. So I would strongly advise a anyone who studies Central Asia, who thinks about Central Asia, to elaborate in those terms. Thank you. Dr. Sari, would you like to um, respond? First, I would like to mention about the China. China, um, yes, China is uh, using the economic tools, but not just economic tools. There are also security issues, security areas, cooperating bilaterally each Central Asian countries. Because China is concerned on the uh, separatism and the radical groups, and they consider Central Asia kind of transit place to those groups to, to China, Western China, Xinjiang or East Turkestan region. Uh, then the, the pushing the Central Asian countries to sign the agreement, not just economic one, but the security issues. Economic area, China has the two um, uh, level policy. One is the to establishing a kind of uh, Silk Road so then uh, all Central Asian countries can involve. One of the projects is the Turkmenistan's uh, this is Silk Road is not just a road. This is uh, road, uh, highways, rail roads, uh, pipelines, uh, pipelines, and also digital Silk Road. So these uh, the China trying to uh, to connect so uh, Chinese products and ideas can transfer to other countries and products and some certain level uh, also this Chinese security concern too. Um, but also, uh, pipeline, which I mentioned, Turkmenistan, the fourth one, is passing, uh, through, starting from Turkmenistan, passing through uh, all Central Asian, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, then ending the uh, China. This is construction is the continue. So this is the, the China's, uh, strategically, especially, they wanted 
that uh, pipeline to Brookville. That way, the Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan will get the transit fee, which is around 200, 300 million dollars, but that's good money for them. So that becomes the more depend on the China, in that sense. Uh, that's the I want to add. Thank you. Um, so there was one more question here. Yeah. Yeah, good morning. Uh, my, no my name is Olga Spicer from Sciences Po Paris. Uh, my, uh, my question is for Luca, but all the others are free to comment. Um, actually, I wonder that uh, we have talked so far uh, not so much about Iran. You have mentioned briefly the crucial importance of Iran for being a potential export transportation hub for Central Asia. I remind you that uh, Iran is the shortest, provides the shortest route to the sea for Turkmenistan and Kazakhstan. Um, however, we knew, we knew that this potential was restricted by the sanctions. But now that the sanctions have been relaxed this year, um, we should maybe more think about the post-sanction scenario. And you have briefly mentioned that, but maybe um, I'd like to dig further. Um, well, what, how do you assess actually this post-sanction uh, scenario? Is Iran really the uh, next exportation hub for Central Asia, for, the, for Caspian Central Asia, I have to specify? Um, especially if in, as you mentioned, for Turkmenistan, maybe to ease its dependence of China. And maybe another factor that I'd like to, well, I'd like to know your opinion about is um, the fact that Central Asian um, gas exporters lag behind uh, in terms of technology, especially in the domain of LNG, liquefied natural gas. So um, what does that mean for the future for gas export for Central Asia and um, for Turkmenistan too? Thank you. Thank you, please. Uh, first of all, I think that if you look at the way in which they behave here, they're behaving, uh, the post-sanction seems more and more likely. So they're behaving quite well. So there is a possibility that the sanction will be lifted any time soon, which is a good developer for Central Asia. On the other hand, though, the way in which the Iranian economy will be structured, in which you will have a very strong private sector, will be an economy that would be happy to have low oil prices, and in turn low oil or gas prices, which is not good for Central Asia. Uh, having said that, you are right. That's the, the, that's the quickest uh, way to get to the Gulf, it's the quickest way to get to the sea, uh, but it's also a market that is, does not have a uh, compatible energy outlook because Iran is an exporter as well. So they will be competitors in that, in that sense. Um, so uh, it will open the possibility for Turkmenistan to go through Iran, bypassing Afghanistan and reaching the subcontinent if that's what will they want to do with the India and Pakistan is, is sort of the demand-driven uh, uh, customers. Uh, but that's a bit of a long shot. So um, I think that we need to see also what kind of policy they will have. They will use their gas for domestic purposes. They will keep exporting. They will export in most oil. This is still not sure also because there is a bit of a foreign policy making turmoil in Iran. You know, that's a very fluid society, very composite elite, which um, to some extent, uh, decides in a way which is very different from the way in which Central Asian decides with very personalized president central decision making processes. Uh, just a quick answer, Olga, to your LNG. There is no way to can make, can make LNG. This won't happen for the next 30 years. The, the gas is poor but to start with, and then even if you have somehow the know how, export is a nightmare because of the fact that there is no sea, you know, anyway. So I would not uh, see that happening, which is a good thing because it means that they know that they're not going to waste more money in that because they know to waste money in the pharaonic project that never work, Avaz and things like that. But on the other hand, um, it limits them to the tyranny of distance, which is what regulates pipeline politics in Central Asia. Virtual pipeline, which is very important for Turkmenistan, and vital pipelines, which is this division I've been trying to make in my work at the moment. It really looks at how they, they're transforming their idea of export into a series of open-up policy that 
actually has always at their core the fact that many women would like to stay in power. Would uh, anybody else? Yeah. Um, we looked into the potential for Iranian ports because they are building another port south of Bandarabas. The thing is, it's a one-way uh, trade. I mean, yes, you will have export products from India and from other countries going through there, through the Caspian Sea to Russia, and probably some to Turkmenistan and Kazakhstan. But the thing is, nothing is coming down. So to be able to have a vital and a viable transport route, you, have, you need <coughs> cargo on both sides. Uh, directions. Unfortunately, uh, all of these countries only export the same thing as Russia. They don't export goods uh, that would uh, fill the uh, vacancy uh, for the return traffic to uh, Iran. Thank you. So all good things are three in, in Latvia at least. So we have one more in the back, please. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Say who you are. I, I know who you are. Sebastiano Fulci, the new Italian ambassador here in, in Riga. So I'm, I'm happy to have a professor who comes from my country to be here. In <laughs> I believe they in 15 years, though. So I'm not too excited. <laughs> but uh, so I really, I just wanted to uh, <clears throat> make a remark on, on, on what he said concerning the 30 years, you know, expectation on, on development of, uh, of LNG exports. I mean, it's true in the US there are uh, issues, but uh, we have this shale gas that is really uh, cheap and inexpensive. And, uh, and of course, uh, um, <coughs> the issue is an issue of cost because, <coughs> because the, um, the, there is a process of uh, Liquids, you have know, to get gas liquid. So there are some, uh, of course, some machines, some installations that are being built in, in some uh, US arbors in order to do that. So you have to liquefy the gas and then it has to cross the Atlantic and then it has to be regasified. So, of course, this process is costly. Um, but on the other hand, I see also the market prices in, of shale gas in, in the US are really low. Actually, I come from there. I was in Washington D.C. and I also uh, wondered why. So, so, sorry, Ambassador, but I, I guess the the, the comment, uh, Lucas' comment, was about Turkmeni. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry, I'm sorry. So and then I, my my remark would be, what do you think about you know the possibility of the U.S. exporting their shale gas to 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 Europe? <sighs> Look, I I don't really work on demand from Europe. Uh, it's to be too much, but. Um, I just want to return to. Uh, I want to make try to, to link your comment, Ambassador, with what my colleagues were saying before. Uh, Central Asia is crucial for the demand that we have in the West, and it's a demand which is geographically located on the land mass because there is no LNG, no shale. It has to come to a pipeline. Turn up, tap you, whatever it is, has to be a pipeline, uh, which is probably where the biggest part of the effort in the last the next 25 years would be. Uh, as you mentioned before, there is this either or which doesn't really add up, but there is only one context in which seeing Central Asia as either or makes sense and is pipeline in terms of supply. Turkmenistan does not have the capacity to support both TANAP and TAPI. Uh, Kazakhstan does not have the capacity to sell as much gas as it does with Europe, which by the way, it's as much as Saudi Arabia does, to expand to Japan and stuff like that. There are limits in the demand, um, because these are significant uh, energy economies, but they're never as significant as Russia or as Saudi Arabia on the other hand. So it, it, it shows to me that um, the connection between stability of the regime international oil prices, European demand and capacity is this sort of quadrangle in which much of the, if you want, international relations of the region will be happening. And it's very crucial to understand what peripheral internal geography ambassador, no importance, actors like Turkey would do in this, or of course, 
uh, what from you know more distant actors like um, Germany or in our case of Italy. We last week we just got uh, any uh, deal in Turkmenistan, which opens question of transparency, open questions of uh, things we probably would, wouldn't like to go into at the moment. But it's interesting uh, how it all happens in this quadrangle of supply, demand, stability, and prices. Thank you very much. So I'm afraid uh, we have exceeded actually a little bit already the, the time that was allocated to this panel. I, I think it was uh, indeed a very, very interesting uh, panel. So I would like to, uh, to thank uh, all the speakers for, for coming and, and sharing their points of view. And I, I guess before we have coffee down, downstairs, they deserve a round of applause. So we have a coffee break until 12.